we are going to be reading some more chapters from Chains. Uh, we had several due this week. I'm going to start with chapter 11 and I'll read a few and then we'll go from there. All right. Chapter 11, June 7th, 1776. There is nothing more necessary than good intelligence to frustrate a designing enemy and nothing requires greater pains to obtain. A letter of George Washington to Robert Morris. It felt like Becky shook me awake. The moment I fell asleep. Make haste, girl, she hissed. You didn't start the fire. Why are you still abed? Haste was the word of the day. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't catch up. It did not help that Madam was in a mood. Girl, she said to me as I prepared to sweep the kitchen floor, the bedding needs to be aired. Yes, ma'am. I set the broom back in its place and went upstairs where I stripped off the bedding, carried it outside, and pegged it to the line. Just as I finished, Madam opened the back door. Why are you dawdling so, she yelled. The floor in here is filthy and the banister needs to be polished. And I told you to wear your shoes in the house. After I squeezed my feet into those small dreadful shoes, it was back to the sweeping and then polishing of the banister with soft rags and beeswax scented with lemon. When I made it halfway up the stairs, Madam yelled at me for airing the bed linen on a day that threatened rain. At least she did not call for Ruth's company. Becky had set my sister to scrubbing the back steps. Ruth hummed so loudly, it put me in mind of a swarm of bees and clover. As I gathered the sheets, I watched the gate, waiting for the rebels to arrive to arrest the Lockton's and reward me with our liberty. We would be given proper cabins on the ship. I was sure of it. No more riding in the hold with barrels of salt cod. Ruth and me would have a cabin fit for ladies with bunks and blankets and pillows and three meals every day. Yes, indeed, that was my future. Aren't you done yet, Becky yelled from the back door. We have to prepare the drawing room. I shook away my daydreams. The drawing room on the second floor wasn't a room where folks sat with paints and colored chalk to draw pictures like I'd figured. It was just another parlor. It was another parlor, three times the size of the one downstairs. We removed the sheets covering the furniture. A dozen chairs with needlework seats were scattered around the room, organized around tables with delicate legs. A low settee stood in front of the fireplace and a mirror framed in mahogany hung above the mantel, flanked by oil lamps fastened to the walls. Why was this room, why this room has to be prepared is beyond me, Becky muttered as we folded the sheets together. No staff to speak of, the larder half empty, the city getting ready to explode, and she wants this turned out and polished. Of all the foolish. A loud beating on the front door interrupted her. Dash it all, Becky exclaimed as she clattered down the stairs. Keep folding, she called to me. Not for love or money. I peered out the front window. The group of men clustered in the front steps did not look like angels, but they could have been in disguise. Four wore the coats, breeches, powdered wigs, and hats of merchants. One had papers tucked under his arm. Six soldiers stood behind them, all wearing uniforms, but carrying long metal bars instead of guns. Becky opened the door and the men filed inside. I stepped out into the hall and peered down the stairs. The man with the papers under his arm had removed his hat. It was Mr. Bellingham. My heart sang. A door slammed as Madame flew out of her chamber. What is the meaning of this? I pressed myself against the wall so she could rush by me, then followed her down the stairs. The soldiers had split into two groups. Half went into Lockton's library. Both groups set to removing the windows, prying them out of their casings with long bars. What are you doing to my windows, Madam demanded. Bellingham approached her. No need to fret, ma'am. We are all called to make sacrifices. Sacrifices, Master Lockton asked as he hurried in. This is thievery. What right do you have to destroy my home? There was a horrific crash in the parlor as the hooks that held up the heavy draperies flew off the wall and landed on the floor. Plastered, plaster dust swirled. Bellingham removed the papers under his arm. You surprised me, Eli, he said. I thought a patriot such as yourself would welcome the chance to contribute to the army. Beads of sweat stood at the edge of Lockton's wig. How does that pertain to the ripping down of my house, James. 
Bellingham patted Lockton's shoulder. We need your lead, friends, for ammunition. Good people throughout the city are donating all the lead they own. The Provincial Congress will compensate you, of course, in due time. I have invoices prepared. Madam frowned. How is it possible to turn windows into bullets? The counterweights are made of lead, ma'am, Bellingham explained, and your drapery pulls. This is an outrage, Lockton fumed. No, Eli, Bellingham said, this is war. Even our churches are making the sacrifices, delivering their bells to be recast as cannon. Surely you do not rate your home above the houses of God. The soldiers left the library, deposited the lead weights by the front door and headed up to the second floor, knocking their shoulders against the paintings of Lockton's ancestors that lined the staircase. I wanted to shout that they should search for the money in the linen chest. Instead, I shrank against the wall to let them pass. They haven't restored the windows to the frames, protested Lockton. Where are they going, Madam asked. There are plenty of carpenters who will assist you with the windows if you don't feel up to the task yourself, Eli Bellingham said. Sir, shouted a soldier upstairs, we found it. Bellingham dropped his manners and bounded up the stairs two at a time. Madam and Lockton followed close on his heels, I trailed behind. The bedchamber was large and made, sorry, <clears throat> the bedchamber was a large room made small by the four poster canopy bed that sat as high as a carriage, two massive armoires and half a dozen men with red faces. Madam had once again set herself on her walnut linen chest, which sat in front of the hearth. Why was it up here? Of all the assaults in the dignity of a, on the dignity of a woman, she said to Bellingham, this sir is the lowest, the most base, I shall see to it that every leader in every land knows, Madam Bellingham said sternly, if you do not take your person from that chest, I shall order these soldiers to remove you. You would not dare, she said. Yes, he would, dear, Lockton said. Please, wife, let these men do their work with no further delay. There is nothing to worry about. He seemed to hide a message beneath those words, for Madam relaxed some and stood with grace. If you insist, husband, she said, Perhaps you would prefer to go below stairs, Lockton suggested. The girl can heat some wine to calm your nerves. Madam shook her head. No, dear, I shall remain by your side. Bellingham gave the sergeant a quick nod. The men knelt in front of the chest and opened the, last, the latch. Sorry. Deliverance. They'll arrest them both and reward me mightily. We'll leave this horrid place by sunset. Just a reminder, when we see the words in italics, that means that that's, um, that that's Isabel thinking. One corner of Lockton's mouth turned up in a sly smile as a blushing soldier removed the shifts and underskirts. My heart skipped a beat. Why were dirty linens still in there? Becky gathered all the washing yesterday. The soldier looked up at Bellingham. That's all, sir, clear down to the bottom. I wanted to shout, the money is underneath the false bottom, but pressed my lips together. Bellingham knelt and checked out, checked for himself, knocking the wooden sides. Lockton's grin had spread to both sides of his mouth. Would you care to inspect all of our clothing, James? Perhaps you'd send a man to root through the potatoes and parsnips in the cellar? He had hidden the money elsewhere. That's why he was at ease. Bellingham rose to his feet and stood with his hands behind him. Would he turn on me, accuse me of making a false report and expose me to the Locktons? No. He searched through his papers until he pulled out one that he handed to Lockton. You are summoned to the New York Provincial Congress for suspicion of aiding the enemy, Eli. I am placing you under arrest. These soldiers will escort you. He nodded his head. Two soldiers grabbed Lockton by his elbows. His smile vanished. Wait, Madam said, you can't arrest him. He's done nothing. To the contrary, ma'am, Bellingham snapped. He has put the lives of thousands in jeopardy. The men file, filed by me without another word. Bellingham kept his face straight ahead as he passed by. He cut his eyes at me. They drilled a hole right into my fear of discovery. There was a clatter of boots on the stair treads. Then boots on the marble steps outside. And then the crash of the doors of the front door slamming. They were gone. Madam stared blankly at the empty doorway. Ma'am, I asked quietly. Her eyes turned to me and she blinked as if suddenly realized who I was and where she stood. Don't just stand there, girl. These linens need to be washed. I can't think 
how Becky missed them. I shall speak to her about her laziness. And then she fainted. Okay, chapter 12. Friday, June 7th, 1776. By virtue of the authority vested in us by certain resolutions of the Congress of the Colony of New York on the 7th day of June, do therefore summon you to appear before us to show cause, if you have any, why you should be considered a friend to the American cause. Summons from the New York Provincial Congress to a suspected Tory. So that's specific wording that they used when they summoned someone like, um, like, uh, oh my goodness, I just forgot his name. Lockton. <laughs> when they summoned someone like Lockton, this is the type of writing that they would use. So that's what it sounds like. He's being summoned to this Congress. So it's kind of like being called to court. Becky sent me to fetch Lady Seymour to help Madam get through having her husband arrested like that. The old lady lived two blocks north of Trinity Church, the one with the spires that scraped the sky. It's one of them old Dutch style houses. Got a red door and a knocker that looks like a heart, Becky said. You can't miss it. The house was not far from City Hall, along the street where soldiers with heavy axes were chopping down a row of tall poplar trees. Fortifications, a soldier explained to a cart man to protect against the invasion. Any day now, they say. The red door made the house easy to find. I walked through the beautiful garden around the back. Neatly trimmed boxwood hedges created a path lined with young betony plants, lavender, all day or day lilies and honeysuckle. Mama would have admired the roses. My fingers itched to pluck the scraggly weeds that were weeds that were crowding them, but I dared not. I knocked at the back. The door was opened by the whitest girl I'd ever seen. Her skin was pale as water, except for two flame colored spots on her cheeks. Her eyebrows and eyelashes were near invisible and her eyes a mix of pewter and blue. She wiped her hands on her apron and said something I didn't understand. I've come for Lady Seymour, I explained. Madame Lockton requires her presence. She frowned. What will do? What did you say, I asked? And now she's speaking in another language, which I don't know how to pronounce. So I'm gonna I'm going to skip it. Um, but she's saying this to Isabel. She said before she closed the door in my face. What was an ogen bleak? Just the word that she used. New York was a was stranger every passing day. I knocked again, but there was no answer. I was about to walk home when I heard Lady Seymour's voice through an open window. A moment later, the door opened and she stood there in the kitchen. I curtsied proper like, pardon ma'am, but they've arrested the master, Madame is poorly. She nodded, they've been hunting loyalists all day. I told Anne it would come to this, come inside child. Isabel, is it not? The kitchen was larger than the Lockton's with a tiled hearth and copper pots hanging on the wall. A smoke colored cat curled itself around my ankles, its tail in the shape of a question mark. Please sit down, you must be hungry. I perched on the edge of a chair. Lady Seymour poured me a mug of fresh milk. My surprise at having a proper lady do so must have shown on my face. You could use some building up, she said, as she pushed a plate of molasses cookies to me. Eat and tell me everything. She turned to her servant who stood by the hearth, also again speaking in this language. Um, they did mention that the house was a Dutch style house. And this language to me looks similar to Dutch, but I don't actually know. So that's something we can discover together if we decide to Google it. The strange girl bobbed once and left the room, the pale pink ribbons from the back of her cap trailing behind her. She speaks only Dutch, now we know. Lady Seymour explained and shows no inclination to learn English, I'm afraid. Now a bite and the events. I chewed the cookie quickly, took a sip of milk and recounted near everything. Though I neglected to mention my role as the household spy, she listened carefully as I spoke and asked plenty of questions. Did Eli say anything to the men who arrested him? Did he give any names? Not in my hearing, ma'am. She sat back in her chair. He's in no danger as long as he stays silent. She broke off a piece of cookie, popped it into her mouth and chewed. I imagine Anne is in a lather. Yes, ma'am, I said carefully. She told Becky to pack the trunks for Charleston. Lady Seymour shook her head. I don't blame her, but fleeing will ensure that the rebels would take everything. Yes, ma'am, I mumbled. I took an overly large bite of the cookie, certain she would send me back straight away. She tapped her forefinger on the table as she pondered, her rings flashing in the light. Right, she said firmly, having come to 
to a decision, to a decision, <laughs> to a decision. I will write a note for you to take to the lawyer's office before you go home and another for Anne, telling her that Eli will soon be set free. The Dutch girl came back to the kitchen and said something that I could not make out at all. Lady Seymour rose from her chair and mentioned for me to stay seated. Finish those cookies, please, and drink a second glass of milk. You can't run errands unless you're properly nourished. Okay. I'm going to go on to chapter 13. Chapter 13, Saturday, June 8th, Friday. Oh, Saturday, June 8th through Friday, June 21st, 1776. I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. That your sex are naturally tyrannical is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute, but such of you as wish to be happy willingly give up the harsh title of master for the more tender and endearing one of friend letter of Abigail Adams to her husband, John. So this is maybe some confusing text. It's basically, it's pushing back against the idea that women are property of their husbands and that men should not treat them as mass, should not be a master to their wives or to women, but um, that they should be friends to their wives. So that's, we'll see how that relates to the chapter, but this is a note from Abigail Adams to her husband, John Adams. Okay. The front door opened the next morning as I walked down the stairs carrying Madam's chamber pot. It was Master Lofton, back from being arrested. His clothing was rumpled and he looked as if he'd not slept. He paused when he saw me. Tell Becky I require strong coffee and food. Where is your mistress and what is she doing? Above, sir, I gripped the handle of the chamber pot tightly, packing. He stormed past me, bellowing for his wife. As I dumped and washed out the chamber pot, I gave thanks. Twas clear he did not think me a spy. When I was back inside, there came a ruckus and much shouting from the second floor. I joined Ruth and Becky at the foot of the staircase, the three of us listening with big ears as Lockton and Madam shouted at each other. Shh, said Ruth, putting her finger to her lips. That's right, little one, said Becky. If they don't pipe down soon, the whole neighborhood will turn to watch. Crash. And the basin, she added. Do they often fight like this, I asked. Often enough, Becky said. She stopped as Madame cried out in pain. The master likes to be obeyed. He's not happy. She wants to head for Charleston and she don't want to stay here. Lockton lowered his voice some, but he was still angry and scolding. Should we do something, I asked. Perhaps Lady Seymour could calm him. Becky shook her head. Would fire him up even more. Best not to discuss these things. Ruth, su Ruth sucked her thumb in her mouth. Once the fighting had ended and the master had been served his meal, I took a cool compress and mug of cold ale up to Madame. As she applied the compress to her swollen split lip, she scolded me for not scraping candle wax that had dripped on the floor. It caused me to fall, she said. Do you see what your clumsiness has cost me? We both knew it was a lie. There was no wax on the floor. A few drops of blood stained the edge of the carpet. What do you have to say for yourself, she asked. I didn't like picking up the blame and carrying it, but I had no choice. I bowed my head. I beg forgiveness, ma'am, and she promi and I and promise it will not happen again. She removed the compress and winced. It had better not. In the few in the weeks that followed, the master had me serve him whenever his companions visited. I listened closely to their conversations, but they blew only hot air, complaining about the Congress and the weather and the effect of the war on business. I was relieved to hear that the printer, Inkstain, had fled the city with his wife and children. Lockton was certain that he had told the rebels about the money and the plan to bribe the American troops. My secret was safe. Becky brought back peas, greens, and gossip from the marketplace. The British fleet was in the harbor. No, the fleet had sailed for Jamaica. No, the Congress had negotiated a peace. No, the British planned to kill us all while we slept. Gossip is the foul smell from the devil's backside. That's what mama always said. I tried to ignore the wild stories and stay alert for something, anything I might use to secure our freedom. Becky had been quite happy to give me the chore of hiking up to the tea water pump every day. After my first few visits, it became my favorite part, the favorite part of my day. 
The pump was set in a little shed at the edge of the common, a big gathering place ringed by army barracks, the poorhouse, and the jail. There were trees and fields to the north of the common and, and the burying place for Africans. The air was cleaner up there, easier to breathe. A week after Lockton returned home, Curzon stood with me in the line of servants waiting for water. I was desperate to ask him questions, but knew they had to wait until we were alone. When my turn came, I handed my buckets to the ancient slave who worked the pump handle. The man, old as dirt, with stone gray hair the skin, and skin the color of the night sky. He carried a country mark on his face, three straight lines that had been cut into his right cheek when he became a man in Africa. Papa had a mark that looked close to it. It made me feel like kin to the old man. And I smiled and curtsied polite whenever I saw him. Thank you, grandfather, Corazon said to the man as he handed the, us the full buckets. I was surprised. He's your grandfather? I didn't know that. The old man chuckled softly and reached for the buckets, the girl, of the girl standing behind me. I'm the grandfather of everybody and everything. He pushed down the handle of the pump and water flowed. Mind how you go, Missy. Curzon waited until we were two blocks down Queen Street before he asked me about Lockton's affairs. He traveled to Fairfield in Connecticut two days ago and came home last night, I said. I thought he was on a, a parole um, that they had to stay in New York. Why don't they arrest him? Curzon looked back looked behind us and from side to side before answering. They don't have enough men to follow him, he explained, and his aunt has powerful connections, both here and in England. They must be, they must, there must be solid proof before they dare arrest him again. Should you ever come in possession of letters sent to him or maps or, or if I find the king hiding in our pantry, I interrupted. The Congress would give you a medal for that, he said with a grin. I would rather have passage home on a fast ship. You don't want to sell, sail anywhere, not now, he said, doffing his hat and bowing to three officers passing on horseback. I likewise bobbed in the direction of the gentlemen and waited for them to draw out of earshot before speaking again. Why not? The Royal Fleet is fast approaching and is eager for battle and spoils. If you sailed now, you'd likely be captured and sold to the islands. Idle gossip and pipe smoke, I said. You hear it on every street corner. It's a wonder we don't all choke to death on it. Where you see smoke, you find fire country. Don't worry, the day of our liberty will soon dawn. The country is going to be free and you and me with it. For a boy with a little head, you sure have big dreams. I just want what's owed me. You need to be patient, he said with a frown. The army has bigger fish to fry than you and your sister. And I have bigger fish to fry than your army, I said with a whole with a whole lot more confidence than I truly felt. The sun set later and later in those weeks. The extra light was welcome and put to good use. I aired out our pallet and blanket and tidied our cellar corner. The potato bin was near empty and Ruth asked to play in it, if it if, as if it was a little house. I would not let her. Instead, I made her a cornhusk doll, painting the face on it with pokeberry juice and fashioning a gown for it with a piece of cambric from Becky's scrap bag. One night, feeling out of sorts and reckless, I crept up the stairs. It was after midnight and locked in his wife slept heavily. I snuck into the library and took a book from the shelves, a story called Robinson Crusoe by Mr. Defoe. I sat by the glowing coals in the kitchen hearth and read it until I could not hold my eyes open any longer. When the fat moon rose the next night, I planted the mystery seeds I had taken from mama's jar. I did not know what they would grow into, but planting them deep into the cool dirt was a comfort. Thunder boomed in the distance, a summer storm approached. I ought to check the cows, I thought. Storms made them nervous. More thunder rolled and then a third wave. Fool, I scolded myself. The cows were in our old life, not this one. The moon climbed higher and the air returned to stillness and waiting and I took myself to bed and did not dream. Okay, chapter 14. Saturday, June 22nd, 1776. Life, very uncertain, seeming danger scattered, thick around us, plots against the military, and it is whispered against the Senate. Let us prepare for the worst. We can die here, but once we may, all our business, all our purpose and pursuits tend to fit, fit us for that important event. A letter from Congressional Delegate Abraham Clark to Elias Dayton. 
The next day I carried a basket of eels and fish. Sorry. The next day I carried a basket of eels from the fish market to Wall Street, thinking only of hot eel pie for supper. I had not eaten eel pie since mama died, Miss Mary Finch not being fond of it. But Master Lockton enjoyed the dish, so fat eels weighed down my basket. I fervently hoped Becky would chop off their heads and strip their skins. It made me go all jumbly in the belly to chop off their heads. I entered the kitchen and set the basket on the table. Ruth hummed quietly to herself, shelling peas into a large wooden bowl, and Becky chopped kale. Madam walked in from the front hall, her hair half fallen out of her cap and stains of sweat under the arms of her dress. She crossed the room, peered out the back door, crossed her arms over her chest and tapped her foot with impatience, then disappeared into the next room. I require you, girl, she said. Becky looked at me, eyes, wi eyes wide and warning. Ma'am, I asked. Madam came back to the kitchen carrying a silver tray. She shoved it into my arms. You will serve your master and his companions. Becky slowly shook her head back and forth. Are you sure, Madam, that's what the master requested? She asked slowly. Tis hard to interpret the ways of men folk, them being so complex and all, but surely when he said, let nothing disturb us, that was indeed, that was indeed his true meaning. Be quiet, Becky, Madam snapped. You have the manners of a donkey and the voice of a goose. Becky said nothing more, but chopped faster. Madam paced back and forth. The mayor of New York is, supremely, is a supremely important man, could well be the next royal governor. It's hardly appropriate to welcome him into our home without offering refreshment. She turned to me. You will not put one foot wrong. When the tray was loaded so heavily I could scarcely lift it, Madam preceded me down the hall and waited by the closed door to the library. Go on, she told me without offering to help. I kicked the door with my shoe and called out, wine, sir, and a bite to eat. Leave us, responded Lockton. Madam knocked on the door with a not terribly refined fist. Come now, Eli, show some graciousness. Deep voices in the room conferred when the door, when the door was unlocked and opened. Madam stepped toward the opening, but locked and filled the frame. Thank you, my dear, or thank you, dear, he said. The girl can serve us. I'll send for you if I'm in need of anything more. Madam tried to look beyond him into the distinguished guest, but could not see through the thick form of her husband. Very well, she said loudly. I shall be composing a letter to our cousins in London, our cousins who are so well regarded by his majesty. Excellent suggestion, dear. He stepped out of the way that I might enter. There were only two men besides Master Lockton, gold buttons wearing a shabby waistcoat of black wool, and the third man, who I took to be the mayor. The mayor had on a fine wig, properly powdered and pulled back with a curl at the end of his queue, a sable coat and, a match and matching breeches, a maroon waistcoat, and a white silk cravat tied loosely around his neck atop his shirt. The windows were all closed, but sun streamed in, heating up the room to a slow simmer and bringing forth the ripe stink of underwashed gentlemen. Ew. A broad, brightly colored map of the coastline was spread out on the master's desk, weighted at each end by a heavy book. Lockton removed one of the books and the map curled up on itself, clearing the desk for the plate of Gloucester cheese and rye bread and the bowl of strawberries I set there. My most sincere apologies for the interruption, Lockton said. He took a glass of wine from me. Pray, sir, continue. Gold Buttons took a hasty bite of cheese before speaking. It has proved more difficult to bribe the patriots to change sides than we anticipated. Those who are fed up with the situation prefer to melt out of the city and walk home to Massachusetts or North Carolina. I removed the serving tray and retreated to my corner. The horses in the paintings still leapt the fence, I fought the temptation to reach for the adventures of Mr. Caruso on the shelf. Instead, I centered my eyes on my feet and my thoughts upon a slice of eel pie. They turned down the offer of hundreds of acres, Lockton said. The land offered by the king is distant from their farms, gold buttons buttered a piece of bread. My fellow reports they simply want peace and the chance to get in a good crop of wheat. Idiots, said Lockton. The news from Pencil, I'm sorry, the news from Philadelphia is that Congress is close to declaring independence, Gold Buttons continued. 
I fought the urge to yawn. The master and his friends could complain about the Continental Congress at such length, I feared my ears might drop off. Lockton plucked a strawberry from the bowl and pulled the leaves from it. And Admiral Howe continues to delay the invasion. It's maddening. The crown must smash this rebellion into dust so we can return to our former lives with a sense of order. And higher profits, Gold Button added. If Madame only knew how dull these gatherings were, she would not be so anxious to barge her way in. I would have happily chopped off the heads of a barrel full of eels to escape another afternoon trapped with men whose voices droned on and on and on like rumbling dusty grindstones. The mayor set his goblet on the desk. The time for bribery and persuasion is past. This is the hour when we must unsheathe our swords. Swords? Lockton shook his head. We've been over this, David. Our task is to hold the city loyal and nothing more. The mayor leaned back in his chair. Holding is not enough. They're coming after us, raiding our homes for lead and our stores for anything they desire. Gold Buttons wiped the cheese from his fingers with a handkerchief. I agree with Eli. A loyal New York cuts off New England from the other colonies. The rebellion will wither like a vine cut off at the roots. Cut off a vine and it will grow back, said the, may the mayor said. You must pull it out of the ground and burn it to ensure it is dead. Lockton put the strawberry leaves in the bowl. Is there a plan afoot to destroy them? Most definitely, the mayor's voice was quiet but steely. This was not idle prattle about Congress. I stood still as possible. The mayor scratched at the mustard stain on his cuff. General Howe delayed the invasion, hoping the revolutionary fervor would die down. On the contrary, independent sentiment now burns as far as away as Georgia, as well as the Western frontier. I am a bookcase, I thought. I am a piece of furniture, not a girl who will remember every word spoken in this room. The cry for liberty has proved powerful, Lockton said. The beast has grown too large, the mayor said. If it breaks free of its chains, we are all in danger. We need to cut off its head. Gold Button frowned. How so? We must kill their commander. Lockton drew in a breath sharply. With Washington gone, the revolution will collapse, predicted the mayor. War will be averted and countless lives saved. Our world will return to the former state of tranquility we enjoyed before all this nonsense. The study fell so quiet, I feared the men would hear my heart beating. Kill General Washington? No, Lockton said, shaking his head. Not possible. He's a gentleman. Capture him, arrest him, yes, but we dare not harm him. The mayor ticked off the reasons on his fingers. All the American leaders have committed treason against the king. You cannot deny that. Treason is the highest offense under English law, worse than murder. And what is the punishment for treason, my friend? Neither Lockton nor Gold Buttons answered. To be hung by the neck until dead. Then have your body chopped into four pieces, which are sent to the four corners of the kingdom, the mayor continued. Others propose we send sections of Washington's corpse to Charleston, Philadelphia, and Boston. They want to keep the fourth bit here to be displayed in front of City Hall. The room fell silent again. I could hear the ticking of the hall clock through the wall. Lockton shook his head again. You cannot guarantee Parliament will rule treason. It's too dangerous. If we dispose of Washington, Parliament will do whatever we ask. How can you, but how can you accomplish this? Asked Gold Buttons. The man is surrounded by an entire army. We have a man in the lifeguards committed to our plan. He spends his days within two arms length of, gen of the general and our signal on our signal, he will act. And this is why you need the money, Lockton said. There was a sound of a lid being removed and the jangling of keys. Lockton took a key, key ring out of the blue china snuff jar on the corner of the desk. He unlocked the top drawer and removed a tall stack of currency, enough to buy a village or two. I let my eyelids droop as if I were a dozing or sleeping. The risks are too high, Gold Button said in a shaky voice. If we're discovered, we are dead men. Think not upon the risks, but the rewards, suggested the mayor. I peeked, locked and tugged at his collar to loosen it. Suspicion will fall on my neck first, David. I require assurance that my role will not be betrayed. You have my word on it, the mayor said. Your promise is not enough, sir. Lockton pushed a sheet of paper, a quill, and an ink stand across the desk to the mayor. Write down the names of those who know of this plot. Why, Gold Buttons asked. The paper will serve as my insurance should I fall into rebel hands again. It will motivate you and our friends to do everything possible to secure my release. 
how Gold Buttons was still frowning, but the mayor reached for the quill. If we do not come to Eli's aid, he will betray our names to the enemy, the mayor said softly. He is showing us his weakness. Playing ahead is my strength, Lockton said. Do not forget your own name, sir. I closed my eyes again. The quill scratched across the paper. Gold button shifted nervously in his chair. There, the mayor said. I opened my eyes the tiniest bit. Gold buttons quickly read the paper, a vast conspiracy indeed. He handed it to Lockton and who read the names and smiled. We are keeping good company. He handed the money to the mayor and lifted the empty glass. I believe this calls for a toast, gentlemen. I did not step forward with the wine bottle. Lockton needed to believe I was a sleepy servant unaware of his plans. Sal, he snapped. I drew back my head and acted befuddled. Wine, Lockton said. I crossed the room and emptied the last of the wine into his glass. <clears throat> Lockton frowned. Fetch, fetch another bottle, he said. Yes, sir, I curtsied and left the room, pondering how I could pass this news along to Curzon. Then there was a blood... There. <laughs> that was when the blood-curdling scream started in the kitchen. I dropped the bottle and ran. <laughs>